Every Sunday. Sorry, I'm laughing because my wife gave me something to, for my throat. I told her I cannot preach with something in my mouth. Um, today marks the official end of the Chinese New Year, actually yesterday. But I noticed that that funny thing is still downstairs, the 24-hour-7 Kong Si Fa Sai thing uh, still blaring downstairs. So that for more than two weeks, right, that funny little firecracker thing has been there. But I didn't bring them luck, you know, because as I was driving by, I saw one of their kumquat collapse on one of their precious car. So <laughs> that proves that it doesn't work, just to let you know. But today uh, is a, a special occasion. We are ending First Corinthians 16 today. I don't know whether you have been keeping track. We have preached on this almost one and a half years since October 20. 2015, and thanks be to God that uh, we are able to come to the end today before we, of course, naturally move on to 2 Corinthians. Uh, but the Word of God is so wonderful that every time you come to it, you learn so many new things and there are so many wonderful revelations. And I've repeated this so many times, right? Among all of the people here, I'm the one who will enjoy the sermon most because I have to prepare it. And you have to struggle with the text and you learn so much from it too. And the Word of God continued to illuminate us all the days of our life, you know. I was attending one of the cell group by our young people, and they are going through the book of Mark. And you know, we preach through the Gospel of Mark, right, in, in, in a similar manner, very careful. And I was sitting there deep in thought because, man, they were sharing things that I didn't think of, you know. So I, I, I kept wondering, did I say that? Did I preach about that? Did I touch that? Portion And when I went home, I didn't sleep until very late because I dug up all my PowerPoint and went to search, especially about the woman who, who, who was a Gentile. And then Jesus said to her that, you know, we, we won't give scraps. And, and, and she said, even the dogs get to eat the scrap. I don't know whether you remember that part. So there was, once again, it shows us that the Word of God is profound with, beyond our understanding. So I pray that even as we finish First Corinthians, you will not go away thinking that you have seen, been there, done that. It, it's not so simple, right? As I always repeat. So let's go uh, to the word and quickly revise what was taught last week. Actually, we should revise the whole, whole thing. Uh, the last lesson was uh, the last portion of chapter 15. And the, as the Apostle Paul ended the chapter on the resurrection, that great chapter. And it is a closing chapter that talks about the most fundamental aspect of Christianity. The fact that every single one of you will die. And I just saw a Facebook poster the other day, uh, How to Live Life. And one of the statements is, no matter what you do, you die. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no matter what you do, uh, we all die. And at the same time, one of the things that was brought from 1 Corinthians 15 very strongly for every single believer is that you will be resurrected in the body as well. So that's why it's of first importance that you understand that this is the case. But of course, it's the furthest thing from our mind for most of us. We don't even think about death, let alone the resurrection. Only people who think about death often are your pastors because they always go to do funerals and visit the dying and, and people like that. So we get to be a lot closer to the reality of life in itself. And the Apostle Paul opened by saying, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, which is why you need to be resurrected. Because as we are right now in our fallen state, we cannot inherit the kingdom. And one of the last side lessons I gave to you was that, remember also that because of that, your dog will not go to heaven. So we, we are completely different from the idea that uh, the, the Buddhist kind of concept that, that everything has a, a soul. No, the Bible says that only the human being is made in the image and likeness of God. The Apostle Paul then talked about the mystery of the last day, how there will be a last trumpet, a last sound, and the return of our Lord Jesus Christ will come. In Greek, this is called the parousia. And when that happened, I showed you the chart last week, that if you are still alive, you will be transformed with the twinkling of an eye. At a, at a snap of the finger, instant transformation. And those who are dead in the Lord will be resurrected. And actually those who are dead not in the Lord will also be resurrected, but into a different kind of a state. So remember that if you were to die suddenly or finally, the moment you die, we believe you are with God in paradise immediately. And your body remains on earth and when Christ will come again, your body will be resurrected and your soul will join back with your body into a new existence. 
one which is not of flesh and blood. And then we will enter into the judgment for reward, not the judgment for damnation. So therefore, as C.H. Spurgeon say, death is the last and the least worry of every Christian. So if you really understand that, then you don't fear death the way the lost world would fear death. And one of the side lessons there was a started question whether Paul expected the parousia, where the coming of Lord Jesus Christ, in his lifetime, because he seemed to be writing in that way. But we completely would not agree that Paul made a mistake, which is what a lot of liberal theologians think. We believe that Paul knew that he's going to die because when he wrote to Timothy, he said that my days, uh, the, the, the day of my, my, my departing is near, which meant that he knew that he's going to die. But the closing part of chapter 15 was a triumphant declaration of an absolute and complete triumph of God over victory, where death is described as being swallowed up. Remember, I was telling you that Dr. Stephen Tong used the illustration of a dark room and light. When light comes, light swallows up the entire darkness. So this tremendous confidence by the Apostle Paul when he described the way we will have final victory. And that is the confidence you must have if you are a true believer. And Paul certainly demonstrated that. And death should be the last and the least of our worries. And the final verse is a verse that many people will quote. And I encourage you to remember that verse as well. That therefore, we need to remember that in our life, we should abound in the work of the Lord. For every work in the Lord is not in vain. It's not wasteful. But the key word is in the Lord. Remember then I, t- I told you about how in all your work, God may lead you to do different things. But some of us, like me, get the privilege of doing work or live life in which I would honestly say that almost everything I do in my life is in the Lord. And therefore, almost everything I do, I know that it's not in vain. And that's a, a wonderful privilege. I mean, God can call you to do all kinds of things. Some of you are CEO. Some of you are uh, doing work that is a bit considered humble by the uh, secular world. But it's fine. Uh, but whatever the case is, what the Bible proclaimed, that anything done in the Lord is not in vain. What a wonderful way to close the chapter. And today we go on to the very last chapter of 1 Corinthians, as with the normal habit of the Apostle Paul, the last chapters are often used for greetings. So there are a lot of uh, kind of details that is associated with his time, right? People he knew and all that. So from expository anger, some of which are for our knowledge as well. And that's why I, I can finish the whole chapter in one setting. I'm going to be talking about some of the key lessons that we can still draw from verse 1 to verse 4, verse 13 to verse 14, and some lessons about the traveling as well. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and prepare our heart. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you and we do pray that you help us to be like a little child. For before you, we are nothing. And by you, we are everything. So help us to be humble. Help us to be teachable. Help us to understand that it's completely by your grace that we are here this morning. So with a heart of thanksgiving, we approach the last chapter of 1 Corinthians 16 and ask that you be with us and you illuminate our heart that we may hear your voice. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 16 immediately. And one of the first things that we learn from the first couple of verses is that the Apostle Paul, after talking about all the very complex theological things earlier, remember as we go through the chapters, 1 Corinthians was written for a church that was in deep trouble. They had lots of problems, you know, so all kinds of issues. So almost every chapter is dealing with one particular issue, sexual immorality, how the church is splitting, how people are arguing about one another. Um, and, and people have a very strange concept of marriage, the Holy Communion, and the resurrection. You know, very profound stuff, right? That's why it took us one and a half years to crawl through the whole uh, chapter, the whole book very carefully. And so now you come to a conclusion. And you see the Apostle Paul then now deal with things that are a little bit more mundane, more technical, but at the same time very needed. And so the first thing he dealt with was giving. 
Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church of Galatia, so you also are to do. You see the authority of the Apostle Paul here, right? He was the Apostle, the lead Apostle. Back then, many people would have followed his instruction and people would know that this guy is one of the Apostles of Jesus Christ and those were the days where the Bible was not formed yet and so the words of the Apostles were very important. We see here that the Apostle Paul probably was collecting for the poor Christians living in Jerusalem because the later verses talk about how he would visit Jerusalem. At the same time, we do see a universality of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Ecclesia, bodies supporting each other everywhere. So this is the one thing that I have emphasized through the preaching of 1 Corinthians, that the ecclesia, the, the Greek word for the church, the body of Christ is universal. It's not about Bahasa speaking or English speaking or Chinese speaking, Hainanese speaking. It is a universal church. And so we see in the early church, they are expected to support each other. So some of the things that we do in modern days can be problematic. Uh, I am a bit disturbed when I see churches with the name Chinese or Tamil or Indian or Indonesian whatever church because we actually, in some sense, violate the universality of the Ecclesia, the Church of Jesus Christ. So in a ideal situation, a church should be multiracial and also intergeneration. So this church has a lot of young people, some more elderly, uh, at least I'm not the oldest person in the room. Uh, nowadays, I, I find myself to be the oldest person in the room quite often. And, and we are quite intergenerational. Uh, so it's a good and, and healthy sign. Uh, granted that because of cultural expectation, you do have Chinese church, you do have in Bahasa speaking churches and all that. But you cannot go into a situation where you think that Jesus Christ speaks Bahasa. He doesn't, you know. He... he and he cannot understand Hainanese or whatever it is. No, it is a universal church of Jesus Christ that we all belong to. But the first four verses then call to question the issue of giving. And the lesson of giving is an important lesson to have. I want to highlight and remind you once again that we live in a world that is quite drastically different from the time the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Because we now if are in a world where a church can have 18,000 in one sitting, so mega churches are around the world moving rapidly and the church scenario has changed quite rapidly. I think that the Apostle Paul would never ever have thought that one day a church would have like 18,000 in one sitting. This is John Austin's church in Houston, is it? I'm not quite, can't, can't remember where he's from. So it's one of the examples of a mega church sitting. And in Singapore too, we have mega churches all over the place. And one of the key phenomena of mega churches is that you hear them talking about money quite often and giving quite often, right? Some of you have this background, you have attended their church before, and they use various words like tithing, like giving till it hurts. And, and, and in recent days in Singapore, you do hear of people who sell their flats and all that and give to the church. And so it is an important thing for us to understand and to think of. As I said, it has not always been the case. One of the earliest idioms in English, idiom is like a parable. I've learned when I went to primary school, it's a very strange word that, is, that, that says as poor as a church mouse. Have you heard of this idiom before? Yeah, it's one of the earliest idioms. A lot of you shaking your head. Because when, when I went to school, they taught us a lot of idiom, rolling stone gather, no what? Moss, right? And all kinds of funny idiom. And one of them is as poor as a church mouse. That means that if you are a mouse that live in a church, you'll be very poor. Poor thing, you, you're a mouse because the church has nothing. So the concept is that the church has nothing. And so anybody who lives in a church, your pastor, your, the, even the mouse, you've got nothing to eat because very poor. This is a picture from one of Disney's cartoon, Robin Hood. Have you seen Robin Hood before? A very old cartoon uh, made in the 1970s. And so even back in the 1970s, the concept was still that the church would be a poor place. So this mouse lived in a church and then the church uh, pastor is a badger, I think. You know, they're all animals. So the mouse go and come and give the last coin she has uh, to the church, and then immediately the sheriff of Nottingham took it away. So it's a Robin Hood story. So even back in the 70s, the idea was still that a church is a poor place. But notice that the thing has changed drastically with the introduction of tele-evangelists. 
people who know how to use our television and radio and speak and come up with theory. And we have studied this before in previous preaching. That the, the direction of church movement has really moved drastically from the early 70s with the advent of television and radio personalities coming to the stage that we are today. So it's important for us to go back to Scripture to understand what exactly is giving all about. And one of the things that you hear most often is the word tithing, including in our church. We hear the word tithing. Yesterday, we did a, I did a solemnization for a couple that got married. And in this church, the tradition is after you are blessed, after you leave the veil and kiss your bride, uh, Bahasa Church always kisses the bride on the forehead. I, I wonder why. It's quite a strange thing. Because when I got married, I kissed Patricia on the lips, man. Not only that, tilt her down some more, you know, very romantic. <laughs> you know, so many years ago. And so I asked Dr. Tong, I said, wow, you know, your people kiss on the forehead. It's so serious. Did you give instruction? He said, no, it's not from me. So a lot of traditions come from the ground. Uh, anyway, after that, what would the first couple do? Tell me, what's the first thing they do? They give their first offering, isn't it? That's the tradition of this church. It didn't happen. Uh, we didn't give any first offering at our time. So they will give first offering. So our church plays emphasis on tithing. So does so do many of the mega churches out there. And the idea of the tithe is one tenth of your income. Now Singaporeans will ask whether it's gross income, net income, or whatever, because it's got CPF and what have you, right? The answer is do you want God to bless you grossly or netly? <laughs> so you go and figure it out. Uh, the, I, where did this idea come from? This is a teaching taken from Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 to verse 10. And many pastors would use this as the basis to tell people that you got to tie regularly. Malachi 3, 7 says, From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statue, this is God speaking, and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will men rob God? Yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you in your tie and your contribution? You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And here comes verse 10, an important verse. Bring the full tie into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. So many people look at this verse and then proclaim that the tie is a requirement of all Christians. Not only that, some people focus on the verse and therefore put me to the test. When I was studying in the United States, I translated weekly for the late Reverend Caleb Tang, a Hong Kong pastor, and he said that this is the only place in the entire Bible where you are to test God. And so therefore, as a Southern Baptist pastor, he kept talking about the tithe. So you test God and no matter how much money you have, you tithe because God promised that he will pour down blessing on you. And as I translate for him, I felt a little bit uneasy, you know, because it, it's quite a scary thing. And I was a very poor student back then. I still poor now. But anyway, it, it, was, it, it was like, wow, you know, you put God to the test that way. Uh, I would like to let you know that there are many Bible scholars who look at the passage and have different understanding. For example, Pastor John MacArthur Jr., one of the pastors that I quote often, he will point out that this particular context is done in, at a time where Israel had no government. And therefore, there were no taxation. And the government is run by the Levites or the church. It's the, the, the group of religious leaders among the people. So they were the effective government then. So John MacArthur argued that, therefore, the tie, based on that time, is more like a taxation than a kind of formula for all to use. However, today is a very convenient passage, so many, many pastors will use it to tell you that you definitely have to tie. And some will go a bit step further, right, and use this testing thing and expand it further. One of the key arguments of the mega church today is faith giving or seed giving. They will use parables like the parable of the sower, for example, Matthew chapter 13, Mark and Luke also have that, you know, the parable of the sower, and especially the last part, where the seed of the sower land on good soil, and it grows, and it returns 60 times, 80 times, 100 times yield, and then pastors will use that and say, look here, you must invest like the sower. These are seed gift, seed faith. 
You give God one dollar, God will return to you sixty bucks, eighty bucks, one hundred bucks. Uh, and Singaporean and Chinese especially they're very clever, they calculate very fast. Better return than CPF bought or whatever. So so therefore I will give seed gift to the church because I expect God to return. And they will arrange for many people to come out and give testimony that that's the case. That that is is wonderful. That when I invest in God, I get return. And this is one key reason why the mega church grow. Absolutely, no doubt about it. Because as Chinese especially, we are attracted to that idea. And even non-Chinese in America, people are attracted to the idea that you believe in God, you get a lot of things. A while back, we were praying very hard for my late uh, co-worker, the Reverend Alfred Yeo of Zion Full Gospel Church. So I work with charismatic pastors too, you know, because he's one of my oldest co-workers. And he shared with me that in a, he's not an extreme charismatic, very moderate charismatic. He said this real problem, this sort of seed gift concept, he doesn't preach it himself. Because he knows that that's wrong. You know why? If you go to the parable, our Lord Jesus Christ himself explained the parable. Jesus said the sower is the one who, who preaches the good news, not the investment. You know, that seed is not investment. It is the seed of the gospel entering to your heart. So, you know, anyone who tells you that those parables is about giving God one buck and God give you 60 bucks in return completely, absolutely misrepresent the Bible because... Our Lord Jesus Christ himself explained this very well. But it's so attractive that Pastor Yo said that one time he was in church and they had worship service and they got this guy up there to give testimony. The guy spoke in Hokkien, right? He says, Sing ya so jin ho. What sing ya so? What you know? So believe in Jesus is so good. When I believe in Jesus, I strike lottery. So Pastor Yo said that, well, you know, maybe he was mistaken. Maybe he meant he was so happy as if I struck lottery. So on the spot, he asked him, no, uh, brother, you, you mean you were so happy you struck lottery? He said, no, no, really, I struck lottery because I've been buying this number for a long time. Uh. Then right after you preached to me, the number strike. And so, sing ya, so very good, you, you can strike lottery. And that kind of thinking is deeply embedded into many, many churches today, uh, which result in the mega size that they have today. To run a mega church is a very complicated thing, you know, because you're talking about thousands upon thousands of people appearing at the same time. You know how much money it costs to sustain that kind of operation. And by the way, we are a mega church too. Any church that's more than 2,000 people is considered a mega church. So the Reformed Evangelical Church definitely is a mega church. But of course, we are not mega mega. Maybe there should be another name for this type of other kind of a mega church. And so therefore, many people want to use the word Thai to get the congregation members to give. And so in the mega churches in Singapore, they have gyro forms. And as you leave, can you please fill up your gyro form so that we don't have to chase you for the money? The automatic deduction from a charity angle is, is a wonderful thing to do. So moving from Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, going forward, there are other kind of teaching as we enter into the New Testament. And one of the biggest one that we see is from our Lord Jesus Christ himself about how giving actually is not just about the tithe, it's also about relative value, not absolute value. Relative value means that relative to what you have, not just because the number of zero is very big, so it's a big deal. And the clearest example of this is the incident of the widow's offering. This is not a parable, but an incident. Jesus Christ saw it himself. And it is found in Luke chapter 21, verse 1 to 4, and Mark 12, verse 41 to 44. It was a very simple kind of a situation. The Bible says, Jesus looked up and saw that the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. And he saw a poor woman put in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them, for they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. So from Malachi into the New Testament, Jesus Christ then gave us a higher principle. And the higher principle is that giving is relative to your wealth and not about the absolute. So in this particular case, the rich man gave a lot of gold. But the poor woman gave two copper coins, which are small little, they call it the mites, the, the widow's mite, which are like the, the smallest denomination, like a one cent kind of thing. However, it is all that she had. And Jesus said in the eyes of God, she has given more. 
So therefore, the giving that we do is relative to what we have already received. This is an extremely important principle. For example, if you are a billionaire, how many zeros are there in one billion? How many? Twelve. Am I right? Uh, nine, nine, sorry. Twelve is a trillion. Nine. Sorry, I'm a financial idiot. And you say that you give the church one million dollars. Okay, quick, do your math. I know some of you are still sleeping. One million dollars or one billion? How many in percentage? How many? Yeah, it comes to money, you're very sharp. Right? Zero point one percent. So if you give if I discover one million dollar, not rupiah by the way, uh, Singapore dollar, one <laughs> one million Singapore dollar in my offering back today, I guarantee you my offering collector will be jumping for the oh, you have one million dollar. In the sight of God, nothing. Because it's point one percent of what you have, right? But in the sight of man, it's like, well, big deal. One million dollars come in. 0.1% relative to what you have. A tie of a billion is how much? How many? 100. Yeah, 100 million, right? By this token, you know that in our church, people don't tie. <laughs> because I know our church has many billionaires. <laughs> if that were the case, we don't have to do anything, isn't it? But it's not about a billionaire, as the parable tells us. It's about relative to what we have that the Lord has given to us. And then, of course, entering into the text today, then we get further revelation and further clarity as to what giving is all about. The Apostle Paul says, on the first day of every week, which is a Sunday, by the way, not Monday, eh? first day of every week is a Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. So from this verse, there are a couple of principles that are important for us to know. Number one, giving is for everyone. Because the Apostle Paul says, each of you. One of the things that we always think about is that, oh, you know, when I come to church, better go to a church where there's rich people. Because if there's rich people, we get things done. That's the way the world looks at how things are done, isn't it? But not the way God looks at how things are done. Each of you. Because... Tracing all the way back, every single one of you are made in the image and likeness of God. Every single one of you are humble to hand. You are all servants of God, except that you are servants in different arena. Therefore, each of you is to set aside something, no matter how poor you may be or how rich you may be, because this is your responsibility. And this biblical principle is applied to the work I do in the charity Habitat for Humanity. We expect all house partners, the people we build houses for, to do something, to give something. Uh, recently, I gave instruction to my staff. You know, in Singapore, we clean up the houses of the elderly poor, right? I said, go and figure out some kind of piggy bank and put it in their house so that they will give something. Then he said, oh, no, you know, some people are so dirt poor. I said, I don't care. One cent also good, two cents also good, five cents also good. So because each of you must bear responsibility for the whole household of God. This is an important principle. So never ever have a victim mentality and say, oh, poor little old me, I cannot do anything for God. Remember last week, I told you about Matthew chapter 10. One glass of water is enough for Jesus Christ to remember the air for all eternity to come. So the way God thinks is very different from us. The economic principle of Jesus Christ completely different from the principles of the world. So we want to adhere to the principle of the Bible. Each of us have to give. Not only that, you see the Apostle Paul says, you put something aside and store it up, telling us that giving is planned, not ad hoc. So in this, I'm sure a lot of us are very guilty that when it comes to offering time, it's like, okay, let me quickly scramble and find what to give. Why the smallest denomination? Got rupiah, not give away the rupiah first, something like that. So it's, it's an ad hoc thing for many of us, but the Bible tells us that giving should be planned. It is part of what we understand to be our responsibility. The underlying principle here is that God can do anything in the world. However, God has chosen to work through us. We have gone through this before as we were preaching through 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the body of Christ. I mean, God can snap a finger and supply everybody in the world and solve all problems and do anything He wants. But God, in His ultimate and perfect wisdom, has chosen to use us as His hands and feet, and He wants to use us as the channel of His blessing. That's why the anthem song is, Make me a channel of your peace. And sadly, if we choose not to do it, God will allow the world to spin out of control. 
and then finally hold us accountable because we have not done our duty. And so giving is actually a solemn thing, a planned thing, something you think through very, very carefully. And one of the things that I want to remind all my chairperson in the worship service is when you collect offering and you give a prayer, never ever say, oh God, I'm giving you back a token of what you have given to me. This is a very traditional thing, you know, people use the word token. You know what a token is? I uh, give you something, uh, token. Uh, in Cantonese, it's easy, easy. Uh, I do it as, you know, like, like Chinese New Year just passed, right? Uh, when you receive an ang pao, uh, you know, okay, uh, it's just a token. Token means there's no money inside, you know. It's just a bless you with a red packet. Then the kid will open up, ha, no money. Then you say, it's a token. That's what token means. No, giving is not a token. Giving is out of the abundance that God has given to us in obedience to His Word and understanding that it's a privilege that He has given to us to be part of His work. He wants to work through us and through our resources and our faithfulness and our stewardship, and we give. So it is planned, not ad hoc. And also here you see the principle again. It's a proportionate giving because as He may prosper... In other translation is in keeping with your income, New International Version, as God has proposed him, uh, King James Version. So therefore, the more God has blessed you, the more you return. And I always tell you, this is called the Spider-Man Principle. Because a lot of you cannot remember Bible, you remember movies. So I say Spider-Man Principle. With great power comes... <laughs> yeah, see? Bible verse you don't know, but this type of thing you know so well. You know. With great power come great responsibility. With great resources also come great responsibility as the Lord has prospered you. And then another principle is seen in the next few verses. Verse 3, And when I arrive, I will send those with whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. That's why we know that it's the gift for the poor in Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So then he ends the whole instruction relating to giving. But here we see a very strict principle of financial accountability on the part of the leaders and of the church. And the Apostle Paul is very careful. He said that whoever collects the money from you will be accredited by letter. So I'll give the guy a letter to say that this is my, my, my guy. You know, because fraud can happen. I will tell you that at this stage in my life, I know there are two things that you can make a lot of money from. Number one, religion. Number two, charity. And I'm in both. Right? So, because people will give out of the goodness of their heart for charity. And they often time will not want to trace it. Now, if I give you 10 million bucks, not rupiah again, uh, 10 million dollars, I will track it. I want you to report back to me how you use the 10 million dollars. And now I have this massive program that I'm doing in Cambodia. So I have to keep tracking back and doing a lot of report. But if I were to give you $50, quite unlikely that I would find out from you, hey, what happened to the $50, right, in charity? The other day, some guy came to visit me because I volunteered at his uh, charity. So not only do I work in a charity, I'm also a volunteer for other charities. So I've been doing this thing with the old people in one of the homes. It was mentioned in a newspaper the other day. And I, I taught them photography. And so if they came to say Happy New Year and all that and gave me a, a card. I noticed that the card... I, I didn't know, so I just said thank you and everything. And after he left, I looked at the card. There was $30 NTUC voucher inside. So very nice gesture on their part. But who is to say that there weren't 100 NTUC voucher in the beginning? And then, I'm not saying that guy took it. I'm just using it as an illustration, isn't it? So the, the kind of accountability in charity in this area is not like other things like, like in business. Because along from his office to me, maybe... 70 disappear. And it happens in church all the time. Uh, Dr. Seven Tong, one of his famous illustrations is that when he was very young in his 20s, he went to Taiwan to, to preach for something like 26 days, many days. And he was very poor. He sold his watch and his accordion to raise the money to go. And at the end of the day, they gave him an honorarium that was only enough for him to buy ticket back to Indonesia. 19 years later, if I remember the number correctly, he met the, another guy who used to be the organizer in uh, Taiwan, and this, they were in Canada now. And the guy told him that, hey, you know, uh, last time when you came, we gave you this amount of money. You know, was it enough? And Dr. Tong said, no, something like 20,000 or something like that. And 
uh, uh, NT, new, new Taiwanese. He said, no, you only gave me like one-tenth of, of that. The other fellow was very shocked. How can I be? He's very certain that because you are Hamba Tuhan, right, servant of God, so we, we actually prepare money for you. Dr. Tong said no. So till today, still don't know what happened to that big chunk of money. From the time the organizer prepared to the time that Dr. Tong received it, whole chunk disappeared, you know. So, oh dear, I shouldn't tell you so much, huh? because people collect money and all that. So, so <laughs> when you burn in the hottest part of hell, I tell you, you touch God's money. <laughs> <laughs> the general principle, however, in church work is that we are not just to be above board, but you might be seen to be above board. So what that means is that you don't go always go and look for the loophole and whether it's legal, can we, can we pass the legal standard? Not that. The biblical principle for the Christian is always not only above board, but to be seen above board. For example, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 says that, you know, you are not to have sexual immorality. And the Apostle Paul wrote that these things ought not to even be mentioned among you. No? Mentioned, no. So it's not just above board, but to be seen above board. Very high standard, especially when it comes to issues relating to finance and also on the side, issues relating to sexuality. So all of you should know, for example, that this pastor will not take the call of a woman after 9.30 at night. They say, oh, yeah, so old-fashioned. Hello, excuse me, you know. That's an important principle, not only above board, but to be seen to be above board. So some of the scandals that we see in the mega church today is exactly a violation of this. Instead of that, people are trying to figure out what can we get away with as far as the law is concerned and try to, 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 to find the lowest standard that we can handle. No, you look at the Apostle Paul, it's the highest standard. Not only are these people accredited by letter, uh, if it seems desirable, if you don't even trust these people and you want me to be present, then I will come. It, you know, back in the days of the Apostle Paul, you know how complicated it is to go somewhere. It's not like you can hop on to a budget airline and fly all the way there. No, you walk or you take a camel or whatever it is. It's such a tough thing to do. And he says, if it seems advisable that I should go, they will also accompany me. So it is an important thing for you to know. So therefore, giving has many lessons. And other than the lessons the Apostle Paul gave in 1 Corinthians, when we enter into 2 Corinthians, one other very important principle is also revealed. 2 Corinthians 9.6, the Apostle Paul wrote, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God lives, give, loves a cheerful giver. So the idea that your pastor keep bugging you to give, give until he heard, or there's a certain formula you are forced all to give, violates this verse completely. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all time, you may abound in every good work. I even know of one church, Chinese church, that lists out the giving of every single member in the worship bulletin. Wow, that's crazy. You know, because there's a compulsion to tell you whether you give or not. You want to follow the Taoist method. You know Taoist, the hungry ghost man. If I force all of you to give by tithing and you didn't give, we print your name upside down. <laughs> that's the Taoist method. Those people who pledge during the seven ghost man and never give the money. They, the next year, when they pull up the names, their name is hung upside down. Then you know, oh, this one is a cheat. So there are pastors who do that. They actually print out the name. But this violates under compulsion. Therefore, in summary, with all that we have talked of previously, remember always that God is pleased to provide through His people. That God is not going to work magic and get a pot of gold that appear right before you. The principle of the Bible is that God provides through His people. And if His people refuse to give, there is a very high probability that God will allow the situation to spiral out of control. But in due time, get His people to be accountable, especially at the last day. And second, that giving is every Christian's sacred privilege. It is a privilege. You must understand it because God can do anything 
with anyone and yet he has chosen to use you to give and this is something that is very very close to my heart i tell you every time i i do the work that i do whether it's in this church or in a few the one thing i am thankful for is the opportunity to do it the chance to be in a position to influence the life of other people whether it's the very poor people in cambodia indonesia philippines whatever it is or some of the people i meet in singapore it is a privilege and giving must be planned not ad hoc Giving should be relative to one's blessing and giving should be willing, not compelled. And so in this anger then, the Thai, therefore, is a good basic guiding principle, a basic reference point. We do not, however, believe that giving is a formula for financial success, including the Thai, because of the full revelation that comes about by the time we reach 2 Corinthians chapter 9. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, remember that these are some of the important things that we need to know about giving so that giving will no longer be something that you do without thinking or, or ad hoc and you get trapped suddenly, oh, I didn't know there's an offering kind of a thing. It shouldn't be. One of the side lessons I want to, to bring about to you is that there's still a question relating to how much to give and what to give and how to give and how does it all work, isn't it? Much of these lesson questions and difficulties will end if we are people who understand our role in life as a role that God has given to us for His purpose rather than for our own purpose. To this end, for example, Pastor John Piper advocates wartime simplicity in living. So he believed that the world is in such a fallen stage and Christians have so much responsibility that we ought to live a simple lifestyle. And this is something that I have been thinking about for a very long time. A couple of days ago, I attended a meeting and we were discussing work to be done in Cambodia and we invited one of the brothers to end in prayer. And he, in his prayer, one of the 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 things that he said touched me greatly. And by the way, you know, that's why in Worship service, you need to listen carefully to prayers, to songs, to the word that has been preached, to the video anthem, to the words itself, because the Holy Spirit will speak to you through all these things. This person prayed this particular statement. We pray, O oh God, that you will help us live simply so that others may simply live. Ooh, one of those moments where, where I, I feel shaken, you know that you will help us live simply so that others may simply live. Because when you live simply, you are able to give. It won't bug you so much because you are not attached to so many things. When I do my marital prep course, one of the lessons that I keep encouraging young people to do is to think very carefully about the way you live. If you are not attracted by blinks, things that bling and shine, then you have a better chance in life. If you are attracted to things that bling, expensive things, luxurious things, all these things, as a young couple, you're going to be, have a lot of challenges. And you'll be quite surprised, you know. Some people are really, really attracted to things like that. Uh, one of the marriage that I failed to save has to do with this young man and this young woman who got married and they have a child that's five years old. I didn't manage to save their marriage because the guy came to see me and asked me to help. You know what happened? The wife bought a bag because she's attracted to blinks. She needed, she wanted the bag so much, $14,000. And they are low income. And she bought the bag, $14,000. You know what she did? She went to apply for credit card to pay for the bag. And she applied altogether six credit cards. One card pay for the other card, pay for the other card, pay for the other card. It's a stupid idea, right? And at the end of the day, the thing in Cantonese is chin po lo, you, you finally you will break. And so the credit card company came to the house, knocked on the door, the husband found out, and the whole thing blew up because the husband said, why in the world would you do something like that? And you keep the secret from me, and so betrayer, blah, blah, blah. The wife turned around and said, you are useless. You can't even get me that funny bag with that funny logo, LV or whatever V kind of thing. And I need that bag, you know. What need are you talking about? So if you understand biblical concept, I am of the opinion that your life will become simpler and simpler. And your attachment to the things of the world that blinks, that shines, 
will become lesser and lesser. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of this world will look strangely dim as you focus on his glory and grace. And so that's one of the things that you may want to think about. The rest of the verses are mainly instruction given to traveling. Let's go through it very quickly. I will visit you passing through Macedonia, and I intend to pass through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you, even spend the winter, so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. Paul says, I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend more time with you if the Lord permits. So the letter was written when he was not there, and then he will go and visit them later. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Many people are out there to get me as he said earlier, he died every day, right, remember? And then he mentioned about Timothy, very young guy who followed him. He's like God's son to, to Paul. See that you put him at ease among you, for he's doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him, help me not him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I'm expecting him with the brothers. So Timothy, a very young man, uh, was sent with Instead of Paul, he would he so he is considered one of the early apostles as well. But we don't know how young he was. But Paul wrote to him and said, "Let no one despise your youth." So we see here that there are many people who are called by God even at a very young age. And then comes the final instruction. Now concerning our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to visit you with the other brothers. But it was not at all his will to come now. He will come only when he has an opportunity. I will end with verse 13 and 14. Be strong, watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you be done in love. And then the final greeting. Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they are devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Be subject to such as this, and to every worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Archaeus. Don't use these words for your children, uh, by the way. You know, they will be disturbed in schools. <laughs> Fortunatus is a Greek word kind of a thing. And then final verse. For they refresh my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. The churches of Asia send you greeting. Aquila and Prisca. These are some of the names that you'll find in Acts, actually. They were active early leaders. Together with the church in the house, send your hearty greeting in the Lord. All the brothers and sisters send you a greeting. Each greet one of each other with holy grace. And I, Paul, write this greeting to you. And then the final blessing is given. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be cursed. O Lord, come. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you. And with Christ Jesus. Amen. And at least from the fact that the Apostle Paul wrote so lovingly to all these people, we do learn some of the important lesson here. We observe that we serve God primarily by serving people made in His image and likeness. We love God primarily by loving people made in His image and likeness. Paul shows us that the early church was a community of faith, that the Christian faith is primarily a community-based faith, not a standalone faith. And I use the word primarily because there are times where you will be alone, where you pray alone, where, where it's a devotional time with you and God alone. But from the closing remarks of the Apostle Paul, you recognize that the early church was a vibrant church where people supported each other. He can go to your house and stay there and then they can commute together. They had such close and wonderful relationship. I am convinced that the Bible teaches us that the Christian faith is a community faith. I know some of us in the modern day world live a very private life. We don't want people to come and see us, or talk to us, stay away from, from me. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why the mega church prosper because it's like watching a movie. You go there, you go home, and nobody knows who you are, so nobody cares. Um, and they have sell as well. And many people then fall get the illusion that, okay, I come to church, I go home, it's my thing, it's my own. I don't have to mess with people. Not so. The Bible teaches that it is a community of faith where we serve God, not by coming here just to sing song and take the offering back, as important as those things are, but you serve each other by serving and loving God through the people made in His image and likeness. 
I will close First Corinthians 16 with the two verses that most pastors will focus on in First Corinthians 16 because they are such important and powerful verses, which is in 13 and 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now remember that we are coming to the end of many, many topics. The Apostle Paul struggle, argue, and try to admonish and encourage people and deal with so much issue. So now you come to the conclusion. What are the concluding words that Paul wants his listener or his readers to know? And of course, for us to know. And it can be summarized in these two verses in the very last chapter. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And so there are one, two, three, four different things in verse 13 and one main item in verse 14. First of all, be watchful. After all that is said and done, be watchful because dangers and traps abound all around us. The Apostle Paul never described Christianity as a faith where you are on your own. You just do your own thing. You just uh, go and hide and do nothing and float around. No opinion. I don't know. No comments. Don't know what's happening. But be watchful. The Christian understands that his role in the world it's not a role where you float around, where you are watchful. I don't know whether you are people who read newspaper. I know there are people who don't read newspaper. I could never understand that, you know. How do you be watchful if you don't read the newspaper? I don't know what's happening. It's quite scary to me. Be watchful means that you must know what's happening, that the world is changing. Do you have an opinion? Do you know what's going to happen to your kids when they go to school? Do you know what the government is saying? And you need to be watchful. Uh, I get invited to television very often, to, to talk. Of course, one of the reasons is because my mouth like machine gun. I can talk non-stop, right? In both languages. So, so hard to find people like that for them. But at the same time, it's because they know that I have an opinion, that I have studied, that I understand, that I've been looking at the way the world is going. So the latest one is next week. Uh, budget just came out. So they want to know my opinion on the budget because this guy is watchful. So the Bible says we are to be watchful. So don't, don't put your head in the ground like an ostrich. That's not what the Bible tells us to do. Understand the society where it's going. Are we going to have a brighter future or not based on the teachings of the Bible? The answer is no. And based on what Donald Trump is doing, the answer is definitely no. It's spiraling down. Be watchful. Then he says, stand firm. Unchanging in a changing world. Firm in the word of God without changing because in him there is no shadow of change and this is so important i say this especially to those of you who are parents you have children your child will grow up in a vastly different world certainly than the one that i did and they have so many challenges ahead of them are they able to look at you as a father as a mother and say that my father and my mother are people who stand firm in principles that their principles are right that they don't change they, they are people who, who are principled people. They are not people who talk nonsense all the time, but they are reliable. Can your friends look at you and say that this guy is a firm person, man or woman, that I can go back to him or her and get the advice? Are you the unagony for your friends because they know that you have wisdom? Are you able to stand firm? And one of the statements that is really kind of out of ordinary from the Apostle Paul is act like a man. And that's why I entitled the sermon Walk Like a Man. It's a song, right? Walk like a man. Act like a man. And it's a it's a from different interpretation in the Bible. This is the best the English word can come out with. Act like a man. Meaning you need to stand up to the call and be mature. Be counted upon. Stand up and be the one in which people will look at for leadership as light in the fallen world. And this is such an important thing. And of course, the Apostle Paul was writing to a society that is very man-based, so he used the word brothers and what have you. But of course, we know that he meant for all of us to act like mature people, to stand up, don't be like a kid anymore, and to be the one who would lead and to be the one who would bring light of the gospel into the world. Sometimes the words of the world get very frightening. I just came across a word called kid doubt. Have you seen a word before? Kid doubt. Kid doubt. A combination of a kid and an adult. Apparently this is a new word that people are using. Kid doubt is adult who act like a kid basically. 
collect a lot of uh, figurines la, play computer game day and night la, laugh, laugh, laugh. That means you're all part of it, you know. And it's kind of crazy, right? And uh, I've been to this house in a room where the guy is a kid out. Now I know I can call him a kid out. My goodness, he has this whole setup. Uh, he used his money and buy a whole setup f- to play games, you know. And I was like, wow, this is a, how, how attractive can he be? Then he said, okay, come, I show you. And I sit down there and he turned on the thing and he played this role-playing game and there was like big screen everywhere. And the bad guy fired a shot. No? You know, wow, you know, the sound went from here to there. And I said, oh, no wonder the guy get absorbed into it and play like 24 hours without coming out. You know, the apostle Paul said, wake up your ideas, okay? Act like a man. Don't go and tell your wife to go and tap out her food. Don't care about family and your kid because you are stuck in the stupid room doing that all the time. Act like a man. Take up your role in life and be strong in the face of great challenges ahead for us. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I say this especially to people who are in a Reformed Evangelical Church. One of the things that I fear very much in our church is we are really, really good at talking, you know. <laughs> very good at studying. We have a lot of conferences, seminars, one after another. The apostle, not that those are not important. They are very important. But you must ask yourself to what end? Are you doing something? Or are you just hiding and saying that, okay, I've attended this, I've attended that, I've attended all over the place. Are you going to man up and do the hard work? There is a head. And I thank God Almighty that we have brothers and sisters who are doing that. But we need to be very, very careful. The first time I met Dr. Richard Pratt of the third man, millennium, I went to fetch him. So he said, you know, what is it that you do? Uh, that was many years ago. I said, well, I work in a charity, charity circle. I, I, work among, I work for Habitat for Humanity on top of pastoral work. You know what Dr. Pratt said? Huh? You mean in the Reformed Church there are people who care for the poor? Ah? <laughs> I was like, wow. You, know? <laughs> you mean we care for the poor? <laughs> well, of course, you, if you know Dr. Richard Pratt, you know he's a very humorous guy. You know? He was trying to point out also that we are one-sided in, in many ways. And therefore, I believe with all my heart that my role is not to give you another talk. <laughs> my role is to help you understand that you are humble to hunt. You are... God's servant, that you are to go out there and you do the work of God. And I thank God that many of you have heeded the call. So we have brothers and sisters who are out there doing prison ministry, going among the helping kids who are having tuition for the disadvantaged family. People are doing many things, manning up, getting involved in orphanage in, in Batam. Just yesterday, I went to pray for someone who is in a coma. The lady is, is sick. I am so overjoyed to know that before I went, one of our sisters went to pray for her while she was still awake. That's exactly what it's all about. Going out there and doing the work of God that God has given to you. And, and God will, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, bring people into your, your life. Whether you preach the gospel, whether you share the goodness of Jesus Christ in action, the Apostle Paul says, Act like men, stand up to the call and be mature. And in this area, I think our senior pastor has given us very good example, right? You look at the way the Apostle Paul talked. It's from strength, not from weakness. One of the biggest contributions, in my opinion, of Dr. Seven Tong is he elevated the word of God to its rightful position. I wouldn't even use the word elevate, you know, because it is already up there. That Dr. Tong demonstrated that God deserves the best. That you are to give your best to God, not the rest. And he lived that life, you know. So, you know, if you ever get close to Dr. Seven Tong, you know that one of his key strengths is that he don't give a beep, beep, beep what you think. <laughs> because he is humble to him, servant of God. And so I actually, a long time ago, did a website for him. And the website is called Servant of God. Because I think that that's the one thing that he impressed the most out of me. And so therefore, he don't care about the rich or whatever you say. He understands that it's from a position of strength of our faith. So if you think back at all that the Apostle Paul has written in 1 Corinthians, that's how he arrived at the conclusion. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not weak people. We are not the, 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 the people that the world don't want. We are 
people who are called by God before the foundations of the world. That alone is something that will blow your mind. And so every single person who belongs to Jesus Christ is favored, is treasured, is powerful. As the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God is for us, what's the next verse? Who can be against us? And just in case we then become very who, very macho about everything and bully everybody, the Apostle Paul add on the next verse, let all that you do be done in love. And so this is a recollection of 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter of love. And the two verse therefore combine together to give us a wonderful, wonderful end to 1 Corinthians, summarized by this wonderful verse. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. May the Lord bless us all as we conclude First Corinthians and may we understand his message. I pray that if you cannot remember anything from all this, remember that God is your God. The Holy Spirit will guide you individually as you look into his word and empower you to go out there and do exactly what Paul has said. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for speaking to us and for having us complete this wonderful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. To a church that was completely confused, to a people that were lost in a world that was very fast-changing, and it really described us today as well. And we thank you for your grace for leading us through so many weeks of studies. And now that we have come to its conclusion and we await the beginning of the Second Corinthians, we thank you and ask that the lessons and the words that has been preached will not be found in vain. That when the voice of the preacher should end, that we will listen carefully to the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life, we know that he's living and real and he lives inside every single person who has accepted Jesus Christ as his personal saviour. And we will listen carefully. What is it that you want me to do with my life, O oh Lord? May we be encouraged by the Apostle Paul to stand firm, to be watchful, to take up the responsibility that we ought to have. Stand up, stand out. Act like a man and be strong in all that we do always doing it because of the love and teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a wonderful description for a life well lived. May we be the people who would live this life and may your blessing be felt by us all the days of our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.